My name is Max. Welcome to Sonic Dorms. Today I have a very special guest, the one and only Steve Nagus, who was in Saga for about 26, 30 years. What would you say, Steve? It was about 26 years, yeah. Yeah, fantastic band. And for those that don't already know uh, that I stand for Saga, Saga is uh, everything to me. Their music really did change my life in a big and meaningful way to say the least. And so it is an honor, an absolute honor to have you here for a chat today, Mr. Nagus. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> so one, one of my biggest things with first time guests of the show is really getting to learn about where the artists come from and uh, where they really get that spark, that itch to start playing music in the first place. So if you wouldn't mind sharing with me a little bit about your origin story and how it all started for you. Well, let's see. I think I was about eight when I actually got interested in drumming. And uh, being the old guy that I am, that, that takes us back to definitely way before the Beatles even emerged. So Back then, the, uh, the musical style was surf music. So my first album was a Beach Boys album. So I was playing Beach Boys, Jan and Dean, just pounding on the tables. I actually got my first kit when I was about 12. <clears throat> and I was playing surf music and Ventures music. Do you remember the Ventures? Oh, yeah. One of the best. So, yeah, that's when I got interested. And uh, then, of course, when the Beatles came along, it, uh, it changed everything. So I, I remember uh, sitting in my living room with my dad watching the Beatles live on Ed Sullivan. And he's, my dad said, oh, there will just be a flash in the pen. I'll give them a year. No one will know who they are. So I said, Dad, I'll bet you 10 bucks that... Uh, they're around for a long time. I actually collected on that bet about 20 years later. <laughs> so yeah, so then the Beatles came along and, and uh, I was already, I had a band and I was playing. So then we had to learn Beatles, Beatles and Rolling Stones. So I was playing all that stuff. And uh, shortly after that, Jimi Hendrix and Cream came along, which kind of changed everything again. So we played, started playing the psychedelic stuff, Hendrix and Cream. And that got me through uh, probably close to the end of my high school days. And I grew up in Grimsby, Ontario, which is just a little town down the road from where I am now uh, on the way to Niagara Falls. So, as I finished high school, my mother said, uh, there's an application here for a job with the uh, Bank of Montreal as a management trainee. So I said, well, okay, I guess I can do that. So when I had my interview, they said, well, you can't work out at Grimsby. There's, you know, it's, it's too small. So you got to go to a major center. So I said, well, how about Toronto? And uh, they said, oh, yeah, that's perfect. So my main motivation with going to Toronto is for the music, never mind working in the bank. But I did two years as a management trainee for the Bank of Montreal. And uh, at night I was playing in a country band. So I was working five days a week and playing six nights with the Saturday matinee. And this country bar, it was like 30 seconds away from where I lived in Toronto, Cabbage Town. <clears throat> so I was playing country music. And then uh, about two years in, I just looked around the bank and, and I had two weeks to go to write this accountant's examination. And I went, you know what? I quit. So I went down to Long McQuaid's, which is the big music store here. And I pulled three numbers off the uh, bulletin board. One was a 50s rock and roll band called Bananas. They had they were just forming and and uh, so I joined them and and uh, all of a sudden I was playing like all this 50s rock and roll with five part harmonies and 
And uh, that was really my first full-time gig, apart from the country stuff. And I started playing Young Street in Toronto. I was playing in the, the what was transitioning from topless bars to rock and roll bars. So my first uh, uh, full-time gig was in, in this club on Young Street, which is the main drag in Toronto. Uh, playing 50s rock and roll and backing up the topless dancers. <laughs> so that's kind of first phase, you know, I, uh, and Bananas became one of the biggest uh, touring show bands in Toronto. And it was perfect for my timing. I mean, you know, it was real simple stuff. The band was uh, very well rehearsed. And there was a lot of show stuff. So uh, that was the first phase. And then uh, I heard this band called Tower of Power. And that changed my life. So I went, I quit Bananas. And I said, I got to play this stuff. So I put together an R&B band. And... Uh, playing all kinds of R&B with uh, it was six piece with uh, two black singers, a guy and a girl and black guitar player and a white keyboard player and a white bass player. And the white guys didn't sing. So the three of us in the rhythm section, we didn't sing, but we had three singers in the band. So the vocals were great. And we did a whole summer up at this uh, resort in Canada called Wasega Beach, which is a, a very cool place. And we did a whole summer up there. There's a whole story that goes with that. So I don't, I don't know if you want to. Oh, if you, don't, if you don't mind, just go there. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> okay, so my six piece R&B band, we're playing this gig. It's uh, like Wasega Beach. There's a Dardanella and the Windjammer. There's two clubs right next to each other on the beach. And you used to do a house, house gig there for the whole summer. So playing up there for the summer and, and uh, the female singer uh, gets pregnant or she was pregnant. So she goes off to have an abortion. So now we're down to five piece. The male singer has hemorrhoids. So he goes to the doctor and he's too embarrassed to tell the doctor he's got he's got hemorrhoids. He tells the doctor he's constipated. Doctor gives him a laxative. So two weeks later, he's in the hospital getting his roids removed. <laughs> now my six-piece R&B band is down to the to four-piece, and the guitar player decides one night to do Angel Dust. Why he did that, I don't know, but he did. Halfway through the set, he's falling against his amp. We're walking him around outside and he's going, but why do I exist? And it's like, oh no. So now the six piece R&B band's down to the three white guys don't sing. So fortunately there was, a, with the other club across the street, there was another R&B band there. And the singer would basically run over do our set and then run back and do his own set. And that's how we got through the gig. So uh, basically we were, up, like I say, up there for the whole summer. At the end of the summer, nobody wanted to see each other. The band just folded, disappeared. Everybody went their own ways. And then I started playing, because I always had a great love for R&B anyway. I mean, I, you know, when I was a young guy, I was listening to a lot of James Brown and that, that stuff really turned my crank. So then I started playing rock and I, I got a gig with uh, this guy, Grant Fullerton. Uh, he, uh, I saw him play in my high school when I was just a little guy. He was playing with a band called Stitch in Time, which was way back, just doing cover stuff, but really good guitar player. And I spent two years playing with him and it was original rock music. So I went from playing 
All right, I got the heavy sticks out for that one. So I went from regular size sticks to marching sticks at 3S, baseball bats. Added a kick, second kick drum and, and uh, started playing real heavy. I was breaking stuff all over the place. And I did an album with them, which is now a collector's item, is bringing big bucks on, uh, on uh, eBay. And it, there's two covers for this album. And the covers are both terrible. They're both awful. One's pink, and the other one is uh, some psychedelic crap. But uh, I, when you listen to it, you can hear the, uh, the sort of start of where I was going groove-wise. Because coming from an R&B background, now playing rock, I brought a, my, a lot of my R&B sensibilities across to play rock music. So that was. Uh, Fullerton Dam and I was playing all the clubs basically at that point there was such a great club scene you could work basically every week and uh, I did that basically I, I was working about 50 weeks a year right from bananas on so I was playing a club in Toronto and this there's a at that time a fairly famous Canadian band called Flood F-L-U-D-D uh, they came into the club one night, and the only guy I really knew was the, the drummer, was a, a friend of mine. And the whole band showed up except him. And I go, oh, this is kind of strange, because the only guy I know is not there. But uh, I'm sitting with them having a, a chat, and then Brian, the guitar player, says, uh, yeah, we're looking for a new drummer. I said, oh, yeah, who you got in mind? He says, well, I think we found him. He's sitting right here. So they offered me the gig and uh, I said, well, okay, I need a little time to think about this because I'd already invested two years in grant stuff. So I decided to take the gig. So I joined Flood and then Brian, actually he had leukemia. So he had a remission when I joined the band but a, his remission broke down and he was getting sick. So we had to stop the band basically. And from Flood was myself, Peter Roshan, who was the keyboard player and Jimmy Crichton, that was the rhythm section and the two uh, Pilling brothers, Brian and Ed. With Brian getting really sick, I mean, uh, Ed was in no shape to perform so we basically folded the band. The rhythm section stayed together and, and put together the original version of Saga, which was called Pockets. And we, we basically, we spent eight months in, in a rehearsal room writing a new album. And Jimmy Crichton had basically formulated the ideas for the, the stuff that became that, that first album I see on your wall there. The, the, for the yeah, first the song. Yeah. So we spent eight months writing that album, and I think we learned, we put together about 17 songs at that point, I think, and uh, started playing. So and then we went out and started playing. And first gig we did was in Cambridge, Ontario, in this club to about 20 people. <laughs> that was the start but then we did uh, the first thing we did in Toronto we did a, a simulcast from uh, a studio and uh, that was simulcast on Q107 which was the big rock FM rock station at that time and uh, that was on a Sunday night and then the following night we opened at a club on Young Street uh, called Piccadilly Tube. So we played there two weeks straight and it was just jam packed. So that was really the, the start, the start of the stuff. Meanwhile, we were recording at phase one. I think we did the first album in my drum tracks. I know we did in like three days. We did like 15 songs in three days. And that ended up, they were supposed to be demos. They ended up actually being the album. So. That's what you hear on, on that first Saga album. 
and you're <clears> working <throat> with uh, Paul Gross, correct? Paul, Paul Gross, yeah. Yeah. And you released these records, at least the first three, on a small imprint called Maze Records, if I'm not mistaken. First album, first album was actually initially released by Polydor. And the, I remember the A&R guy from Polydor hated us. He had just signed, he had just signed somebody else, Garfield, this band called Garfield, who no one's ever heard of since. But he was big on Garfield and Saga was like, yeah, I don't care about it. these guys are going nowhere. He, so fortunately through him, through Polydor, the Europeans heard the album and we ended up getting a German record label with Polydor slash Deutsche Grammophon. And because uh, he loved Saga and actually that, that's why we started going over there. And we, we left Polydor and started our own label, which was Maze Records, which is distributed by A&M. And our label mate was Brian Adams. He was he was the he was basically uh, A and M's pet project, if you like. They really liked Brian. So, being label mates, Brian actually came out and opened a tour with us. And here in my hometown, which is Hamilton, Ontario, Brian opened for us here and got booed off the stage because they didn't want to hear pop music; they wanted to hear saga stuff. So, it wasn't a very good blend. But that's uh, that was the early days. So we were playing, we we pretty quickly uh, elevated up into concerts and one nighters. So we were doing high schools and and small halls and stuff like that. It's amazing. And uh, when you look back at, it, especially with uh, Brian Adams opening up for you guys, um, the guys in Saga, of course. I have to just really quickly um, just interject here with your sound because to me it's really important to know your contributions to the identifiable sound of saga at its core and to me it really does make perfect sense when you add it all together that funk background that you really leaned into really did add a unique edge to the overall saga sound and uh, it's really important on songs like humble stance where you really get to hear a bit of that, you hear that groove. And there is something really um, esoteric to me about the sound of Saga. You can't really put your finger on it because there's all these different elements that are intertwining that maybe shouldn't work when you put them together. But for some reason, it just does. It's really, it's 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 A-grade magic, if you ask me. Yeah, I, I mean, basically, I always looked at it like you got a progressive rock band with a disco drummer. <laughs> Not that it was really disco, although some of the grooves I used, I have heard on actual disco hits. Uh, I heard one the other day, which was actually a Simmons kit, and it was the same groove as Wind Em Up. You know? So yeah, that, that, that made us different from all the other progressive bands because the, the progressive rock drummers to me, they all feel kind of stiff, you know, that, that it's that that stiff approach. There's nothing funky about it at all. You know, it's it's very sort of cut and dried, if you like. And that's I come from a completely different area. You know, I mean, I was look, listening to guys like Bernard Purdy, you know, and, and uh, just that 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 R&B heavy groove which I still to this day love. I mean, that's, I'm all about that kind of playing. Even my new stuff is uh, going more in that direction. And so, yeah, I, I really like r and I just think from a drummer's standpoint, it's just great stuff to play and people connect with that, you know? And I think that was a, a pretty important element in what Saga did you know, when we started and maintained all the way through. I mean, uh, yeah, it was kind of all about the funk grooves underneath, you know, which when you put the progressive stuff on top, it kind of changes the whole environment. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I would have to agree with you on that. And the fact that to me, the band really did have something special to them, I think, especially in those early days. And your contributions really did add overall to that sound. Uh, you, what was it initially that made you attracted to those songs? Because I know Jim Crichton, in collaboration with lead vocalist Michael Sadler, uh, they pretty much helped form the basis for a lot of those songs. So was there something in particular that you that attracted you to what they were bringing to the table as songwriters? Well, I, I was like I said, I was already working with Peter and Jimmy and Flood. And uh, Flood was uh, the grooves in Flood were really cool. They're dead simple. A lot of four on the floor kick drum, which was at that point, I, it just felt good. You know, it really did. And they had some good songs. So Jimmy was very familiar with my style of playing, being, you know, being the rhythm section, the three of us worked together. When he started writing, he was certainly writing with me in mind. And like I said, we spent uh, eight months together in a rehearsal room um, in Toronto, banging out these tunes. And uh, during that time period, there was kind of a, uh, two camps emerged, if you like. There was uh, Jimmy and Mike being the progressive guys, and then there was Peter and I, which was more the, the rhythmic side of things. And there was a lot of times when we kind of bumped heads to kind of make this whole thing gel, but uh, it, it really, uh, it was a good balance. And then Peter decided to leave after the first album and it changed the whole dynamic of the, the writing, uh, sort of tipping more in, in, into the, uh, the Jimmy and Mike camp, if you like. You know, Ian, would, he, Ian, the guitar player, didn't really have a ton of opinions at that point. He was just happy to be playing, you know? So it did change the dynamic and, and the, the keyboard player we got for the second album, Greg Chad, was a complete idiot. And uh, we had, we, before I killed him, we had to kick him out of the band. <laughs> so, yeah, and that almost happened. I almost did kill him. Uh, he used to blame everybody else for his own inadequacies. And uh, I just got sick of it one night and he came off stage and he blamed Ian for something that Ian had nothing to do with. I just saw red and I was ready to tear him apart. So they had to tear me off of him, uh, and I'm a pretty mellow guy. I mean, I, you know, I, I uh, very slow fused, and uh, I just blew my fuse that that night. And the next day we fired him. So then Jimmy Gilmore came along, and he was just like this wide-eyed kid. And uh, so I kind of took him under my wing and and uh, guided him through because he really. He was very green, but he was a great player. So I kind of guided him through that the early saga days. It's fantastic to hear. Uh, I've had the pleasure of speaking with uh, Jim Gilmore on, on Sonic Dorms here, and he's always been a delight. He, he really is a really humble human being uh, to this day and uh, the best to me, just as a person. He seems so, he's always at least has come across to me as a, just a really as the real deal, as I like to say. So, um, yeah, he, he so him. So now you got Jim Gilmore in the band and he ends up contributing a lot of he to me. He really brings in a new dynamic to the sound of Saga on Silent Night, the third studio record, which to me really does encapsulate overall what you guys have done on the previous two records. So um, you already mentioned a couple of things, but what to you did uh, Jim Gilmore bring to the band really overall? Well, he was just a really good keyboard player and he was young and enthusiastic and good ideas so he filled the void that that uh, that peter left and he was just very enthusiastic you know i mean he was just happy to be doing what he was doing you know with us so and he i mean he he had really good chops I and mean, he had good ideas and his, his hands were amazing. His left hand really good was back then. 
So it was, it worked. Fantastic. I have to say, so now there's a pivotal moment here. This is one of my favorite parts of the saga story is um, the introduction of the legendary Rupert Hine, which to Rupert me is one Hine. of the all time greatest producers. Um, God rest his soul. He's one of the best. I thought to me, there's nothing like what Rupert Hine contributed, especially to a band like Saga uh, at that point, entering the world's apart era. So what was that relationship like, at least from your standpoint? Well, we'd done the first three albums in Toronto with Paul Gross, as you know, and uh, we decided it was time to make a change and, and do something different. So we moved to England. Basically, we rented a big house there and we all lived together and we were back into writing and rehearsing. We turned the dining room into our rehearsal room. And it was uh, right on, on the Thames, basically, almost on the Thames, uh, a place called Maidenhead, which is uh, west of London, near Windsor. And uh, at that time, we were looking around for studios and production. And Carl Layton Pope was our European agent. And he, uh, he, recommend, he knew Rupert and he recommended Rupert. So we met with him and, and uh, we liked what we heard. We listened to Immunity, which is a great album. And we went, yeah, this, this guy seems to be the right scoop. So we started working with them on uh, Worlds Apart. And uh, again, I mean, Saga was always really well rehearsed when it came to uh, recording material. Like we had some of those songs, we played them ad nauseum so that they were basically ingrained in the fabric of our uh, playing souls, if you like. So I remember Rupert, as we, we went in to record uh, Worlds Apart at Farmyard, the famous Farmyard Studios. And we're just cranking away and the drum sounded great. I really liked the, the room basically. It, it took like a, a, maybe less than an hour to get the drum sound happening. And they had mics up it was like an old barn. <clears throat> so they had mics on the rafters for the ambience and they just brought those up and the kit sounded great. So. I remember Rupert turning to us at one point. He says, well, what do you want me to do? He said, you guys are so well rehearsed and, and the arrangements are all worked out. He, he was really questioning what he was going to do. But he did add a lot of elements that, that uh, definitely took the band in a somewhat different direction, but not far, not far off of what we were already doing. But... Uh, the songs on, on Worlds Apart, they were already written and worked out. So it was just a case of going in and laying them down. And Rupert worked some real, Rupert and Steve Taylor. I shouldn't leave Steve Taylor out because he's, a, him and Rupert were a team. They had uh, unspoken communication, those guys. I mean, they were totally on the same page all the time. Just really cool. So, <clears throat> Rupert added a, a, an element that sort of took us to the next level. And uh, we all, also, also obviously worked with them on uh, Heads or Tails. And then uh, I worked with them again on Chris de Berg. The, the, the Getaway, right? Getaway album. Yeah. You're just looking at it, it's right there. And uh, I also played on uh, Waving Not Drowning. So I did one track on that, which was just kind of an afterthought. You know, we would finish recording, I guess, Heads or Tails. And, and Rupert says, you want to play a track on my album? I said, yeah, sure. He says, well, it's this sequency thing. And I just want this, these drums to come thundering in at the end. So I said, yeah, I can do that. No problem. So, and I love that track. One Man's Poison, I think it's called. So I, I did that. That was couple hours i guess we laid that down that's fantastic i i'm a huge fan of, of those records and uh and i i've heard stories from uh members of saga um, michael sadler once uh, was telling me about how how far um rupert had pushed him vocally so 
for you, did, did um, Rupert push you in a way that you hadn't been pushed before as a producer? Not really. No, but what he, uh, the, the cool thing about uh, Worlds Apart was actually when I got involved with the Simmons electronic kit, which came about Jimmy Crichton saw this little tiny ad in a English trade magazine about these electronic drums. And we were already into electronics. Of course, I, on the first album, I used the Moog drum for how long and for a couple other things. So we were already uh, primed for the arrival of, of the first electronic drum kit. So I, I contacted uh, Dave Simmons, who was uh, working in the back of a music store in a place called St. Albans, which is just north of London, England. And I uh, went to see him and I, I liked what he was doing, but there was three of them working in the back of a music store. There was him, Secretary Daphne, and this guy, Jeff Holworth. So, and they were making maybe three kits a month. They were like, there was very early days. So I said to Dave, I said, well, I'm just in the studio with Rupert Hine. Uh, why don't you give me a kit? I'll use it on my new album and you make you lots of money. And he said, okay. So he gave me a kit and I took it to the studio. So uh, <clears throat> of course this, Rupert being the electronic genius that he was, he was definitely, uh, he was pumped but with, with this new stuff. In fact, there's a great story. Uh, when I got the very first um, cymbal pad, it was kind of a, looked almost like a seashell shape. It was very much like a seashell. And I was just pulling Rupert's leg. Now, Rupert had a, a very good sense of humor. So we laughed a lot. I took this into him and I said, I found this in the back room. What do you think it is? And he looked at it and he goes, well, it's uh, a <laughs> hurdle. <laughs> so anyway, it was an actual symbol pad. But uh, the electronic stuff was, was really uh, cool. They had... Uh, they had some interesting ideas on how we did things. So uh, we actually recorded the clicks from the pads to tape. And then, uh, then I would go into the control room with the electronics and then we would trigger the different sounds. So yeah, I, I, I don't think they, I don't think they influenced my playing so much as we did some cool stuff sound wise. But I, I like I said, we were so well rehearsed that that uh, in a lot of cases for me it was just laying it down, you know. So I was pretty uh, with my style of playing. It, it's not very um, it's it's very worked out. I look for all the good stuff and then I uh, that's what I do. Uh, even if you compare album versions to live versions, they're pretty much the identical fills. It's very structured. And I, I've always liked that way of working. And that, that definitely comes from, I would say, more from an R&B standpoint, you know, work out the details. And then when you go into the studio, it just, it happens, right? You don't have to, you're not sort of guessing as to what you're going to do. So it was all very structured. So, I mean, there really wasn't a lot they could say because I'd already worked out all the, the stuff that I had in mind, you know? Then it was just really more a case of how do we record it? That's you incredible, know? that's incredible. I, I love the fact that you you guys would take the time to experiment in such a way. To me, there, there's nothing quite like actually putting that work ethic that, that to me is somewhat lost today in the art of music. If I, I'm not trying to, stand on my soapbox here and opinionate on th how things are today. But to me, you can't replace that sort of work ethic. And to me, Saga has always represented a strong work ethic, uh, which show Jimmy, showcases in the songs. Yeah, Jimmy was, uh, he was very focused. And 
to the point of sometimes being a little bit too focused. You know, I, I can remember uh, when we uh, we moved to the Bahamas and, and we were doing uh, Behavior, right? One of the tracks from Behavior. And it's just 16th hi-hats running through this whole tune. And we would be playing that for hours and hours and hours. And uh, they would change one chord and then they would play it again. And they change another chord and play it again. So for hours, I'm going, the 16th on the hi-hat. And finally, I said, look, guys, I'm not getting anything out of this. I'm just keeping time for you guys. Here's my drum machine. It's programmed to 16s. I'm going to the beach. <laughs> so I got the fact that, that Jimmy was, he was a taskmaster, right? Sometimes it, it was a little bit too much for me. But uh, in retrospect, I, I definitely think that, that the fact that he was like that kept us all uh, focused, right? Right. How was that success now? Uh, you know, worlds apart, uh, heads or tails, back to back. You're now experiencing some success, especially in the United States. Well, how did you feel going through that? Because I, you had worked your asses off for so long uh, to finally get to that place where you felt you were breaking through. You, you, you got videos on MTV now at that point. This is around 80, between 81 and 83, really, right? What was right. that like for you? Well, at that point, we were already headlining in Europe. So uh, 1980, we did our first tour in Europe opening for Styx. And the following year, we did all the same gigs on our own. So that would have been 81, I think, 81 or 82. It was about that time that, that uh, <clears throat> Because we were we were actually signed to a completely different label in the states. We were signed by CBS Portrait, and uh, we did three tours back to back. We did uh, two months with uh, Jethro Tull, two months with Pat Benatar, and two months with Billy Squire. And there was only several days in between. So for six months, I was touring the U.S. The album was really taken off at that point. I think it went top 30 or top 40 on the Billboard chart. So that would have been World's Part. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, and then we went to Europe and did three or four months touring over there. So in, in that whole year, I think I was only home a couple of weeks in the whole year. Uh, the fact that we were playing so much uh, we were like a well-oiled machine. I mean, that's that's why the when you listen to anything live, it's very close to the album, you know. And, and I'm a pretty articulate player, in, in that uh, I really, I really I'll go back to a, a story uh, when I first joined Bananas that we talked about the '50s rock and roll band. At one point, they turned to me and said, "We're going to have to fire you." fire you I said oh yeah how come because you speed up when you play and, and these guys weren't the greatest musicians so they get guitar player a typical uh, uh, fairly inexperienced guitar player always ahead of the group so I just said okay I can go with that you want to speed it up I can do that and I just let it go uh, what I realized is it as a drummer, it's your job to make sure that nobody does that. So I, I kind of looked at him and said, well, I can fix that. From now on, I'm not going to listen to you guys when you try and pull the grooves because you're, you're pulling them. I said, I'll just play straight time in the pocket and I'm not going to budge. And that was actually one of the best things I ever did because then I realized I'm in control and I have to take responsibility for where the groove sits. And the fact that I was playing simple 50s rock and roll, it really cemented my timing and really helped with that articulation. And uh, I'm glad that that happened because it, it kind of made me more aware, right? I drive the bus. 
<laughs> it's basically how we, I kind of look at it. I drive the bus and you, you got to sit in your seat and don't get ahead of me. <laughs> you know? that's, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, it, that was a really valuable lesson. And uh, so I was really, uh, I was really a, a stickler for this is where the groove goes. Don't try and speed it up. This is where I'm playing it. And I developed because we played so much. I, I just my body clock was so locked into the tempos and where the song sat. It was really interesting because uh, since I've left the band, a lot of the grooves have changed. Like I, I know humble stance now is, is way quicker than it used to be. And and uh, I I don't even know if I could play it at that the tempo they play it at now. It just I mean that's that's an R and B groove, and it needs to sit in that pocket, right? And and it doesn't. I'm sorry to say, but it just doesn't, you know. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, the the, the R and R and B thing. I'm pinging. No worries. The, the R&B thing was, has really cemented where I sit with the grooves. And I quite often I sit on a little bit on the back of them as opposed to on the front of them. But that holds everybody back. This is where it sits. And I'm just a little bit behind it. So uh, that gives it that, that nice body feel, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, and 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 moving forward, you you did that last record with the guys until '93. You had done behavior in '85. Uh, if if you don't mind me asking, what had wh what made you come to the conclusion that you had to depart the band for a few years at that point? If you don't mind sharing, of course. I just I, I as we went through my whole history of playing, uh, I was never. It was never a, a financial motivation for me. If if I felt the need, I would just move on. And I just I was starting to feel the need. I I just felt that we were repeating ourselves. I I thought there was a lot too much uh, looking behind. Because it was kind of interesting when, when uh, Heads of Tails came out. It didn't do as well as Worlds Apart. Why do you think that is, if you, if you don't mind me asking? Who knows? You really can't explain that stuff. It's sometimes you strike a note, sometimes you don't. I, I, and I think there's some really good stuff on Heads or Tails. Um, sometimes it, it clicks, sometimes it doesn't. You never know. You really never know if, if something's going to work or not. I mean, the people decide that. You don't. So... Anyway, it didn't do as well. So there was a lot of sort of turning of heads going, is it your fault? Is it your fault? And that was actually the uh, beginning of the end for me, right? The behavior, that's after behavior because they, they, we were starting to have differences. And one of the things we did writing wise, which I never liked, uh, I didn't realize was um, so you give me a back up a second when I did the Chris DeBerg album Chris being a singer songwriter he gave me a cassette of his demos and a handwritten sheet of paper with the mood that he wanted to create for each song and what it was about and then I heard where the vocals sat so it was really, and the rest he just left up to us. The bass player was this guy, John Giblin, who uh, played with Simple Minds, Kate Bush, Peter Gabriel, I think. A amazing bass player, really great. So there was uh, the only two of us in the studio with Chris. Uh, they brought in Jamie from The Fix to just kind of play guitar and they never even recorded him. And uh, we started working these tunes out, but I had such a sense of direction from the lyrics that it was a really easy album for me to do, right? With the Saga stuff, if you listen closely, you notice that the drums very seldom uh, react to the vocals. B 
because the way we wrote, uh, I was actually finished recording before I even heard any vocals. So they were done after the fact, which is a mixed blessing. There's, there's uh, pros and cons to working that way. But I just thought, wouldn't it be nice if I actually knew where the song was going before I laid my drums down? Uh, there was, and so there was a few moments when I would sort of react to Mike's vocal lines and stuff live, which were never on the album because I never knew where the vocals were going. And I think that created the seeds for uh, Descent for me. I just thought I'd like to hear vocals before I start recording. And that was a contentious issue. So it didn't happen. So they decided to fire Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Gilmore and myself, because Jimmy was in my camp or Daryl as we called him. So that, that's when they fired us right after the behavior tour. And then, uh, yeah, that, that, was, that was kind of a rough period, if you like, you know, there was some stuff that was, wasn't very nice back then. Were you then we okay? decided- I'm sorry about that. Uh, were, were you okay with the, with the changing of the guard on production also, uh, um, not having Rupert Hine on behavior? Well, actually, when, if we talk about the Behavior album, uh, Pete Walsh was a very good guy. I really like working with Pete Walsh. He was good. Uh, the problem we had is we went to this studio in Switzerland, uh, Power Play. Beautiful studio, freaking awful sound. Their drum room was a slate floor, a wall of glass, and stones and glass. It sounded awful. Uh, there was no, the drums had this mid-range honk and it was awful, really terrible. We spent two weeks trying to get the drums to sound good as, as compared to uh, farmyard, which is a wooden farm, barn. You put the drums up, they sound great. You hit them hard, they sound great. We put carpets down and we put curtains on the wall and we brought in stuff and it still sounded awful so uh behavior to me is is a very uneven album in that half the stuff that was recorded in switzerland drums sound awful then we decided not to go back to that studio and we went to uh union studios in munich and that's a big old room and it sounded great again. Uh, for example, the track Take a Chance, which I love the drum sound on oh, that. Yeah. That's the only time I ever did, uh, I split the kit and I didn't record the cymbals. I recorded them separately. So I did a, the groove, which was just basically one pass, do da, do da, da, ba da, ba da. And I went back and worked out the fills that I wanted to place in and then added the cymbals after the fact. Also, I mean, I played that, that rhythm on uh, just about anything that didn't move that. So uh, <clears throat> yeah, the, the sound of uh, the tracks that, that were done at, at uh, Union are incredibly different and incredibly better than what we did in Switzerland. You're gonna also, you're gonna now make me have to go back because I've listened to behavior ad nauseum, but I think after this conversation today and go back and actually see if I can differentiate the drum tracks on behavior. You can. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you can tell if you if you listen to drums sound thin and nasally on on uh, half of the album, and uh, then the stuff we did at, at Union sounds nice and fat. It, and uh, yeah, for example, uh, take a chance. What do I know? They were both done in, in uh, Munich. I forget what else, but there's some tracks on there. I'm not so fond of the songs I'm, uh, on that we did the first half either. We just seem to have better material on the, uh, the second half. 
but yeah, we were starting to fragment a bit at that point. We were, which I, you know, it's funny because I think uh, if in the case of anybody creative, uh, eventually you're going to want to uh, branch out and, and uh, pursue your own ideas. You know, I, I think that's a natural given. If you stop being creative, you can just go along for the ride. But uh, for me, I mean, uh, I, th I think you'll find it quite interesting when you listen to my new stuff, you know, because I'm, I'm just finishing the, the artwork for my, my new solo album. And uh, it's, it's got actually uh, a lot more Latino influence. So I've been listening to a lot of Latino stuff and working that into my grooves. So again, it's very rhythmic, like the saga stuff, but uh, different again, you know. So it's uh, it's much more, like I say, there's there's much more of a world music kind of feel to it. But it's still a still a progressive rock album, I guess you would say. I mean, kinda... I, I can tell that you're that that you can go into all these different directions because following Saga, you did the. Uh... Gilmore Nagus project, which uh, to me had showcased a, a different side for, for both of you in a lot of ways. Yeah, I mean, uh, again, as, as the, we had that conversation about songs, we actually wrote songs for that album. And uh, we were still looking for the balance between progressive music and songwriting, which are not necessarily friendly. You know, that, that's kind of a pull and push issue. How, how far can you push this song without uh, detracting from what the actual melody is? Uh, we, that was kind of a knee jerk reaction in that we just wanted to do something that just kind of grooved and was more simple. And uh, it's funny because uh, just this week, uh, I finally discovered we did a, a video for one of the tracks which you might have seen on my Facebook page yeah how many times right how many times yeah uh it's it's, it's an R&B track really you know and I was quite happy to just sit back and look not quite so intense and let's just do something that's a little more uh easy to take you know because the saga stuff can could get pretty intense, you know, especially a whole night of it for so many years. Eventually, you want just something that, that kind of breathes a little bit more. And that's what the GNP album was. It was more of a reaction to what we had just been going through for the that period of time. And do you think you would have continued, carried on as GNP uh, had you not returned to saga? um in the early 90s yeah i think so we probably would have done that and and one last thing on the gmp thing will that ever see a reissue i know it got reissued i think one time but for somebody like me who wasn't able to pick up a copy of that is there would that ever get see the light of day as like a reissue well as you see i'm sitting in my studio i uh i used to have a functioning cd duplicator if you like that's still sitting in the corner, not doing anything at the moment. It's a boat anchor. Um, <clears throat> the only re-release on that was burn copies I did myself, which I combined with uh, with my last solo release, the Dare to Dream album. And I just did a, a dual CD package and, and I burned and printed them myself here. So th there was no actual major re-release i think i did i probably burned about maybe 20 copies so and it was just something there, there wasn't enough interest in in that uh to really warrant doing a re-release so i just did a, people like yourself that wanted copies i just basically burned them and included them included them with my last album and uh you know that that video that's that's the first time i've actually seen that video since we made it wow 
yeah, and we originally had to deal with Virgin Records, we probably would have just continued on with that. I, I'm guessing because we did go back to the band. But uh, yeah, and, and Robbie has since, I mean, he passed away 13 years ago, I guess. I love working with Robbie. He was such a, a great singer. Those are great songs on that record to me. I mean, anytime I get a chance, to play, I wish I could, uh, I do a little radio show now. If I could ever play like that stuff, I would. It, it's just, I, I, I like exposing people to things that really do get lost. Um, as a self-proclaimed music tastemaker, I, I, I really do feel the need to share some of the stuff because to me, otherwise they really do become lost gems and the ether of, of music as we know it. So to me, some you of the stuff is really well done, well Thank crafted. You. Do you not have a, a copy of the, those songs? I do not. A physical copy? No, I do not. And uh, of course, they go for astronomical prices on eBay if you, if you <laughs> do find them, because they are a rarity. Just like your, uh, just like the records that uh, are out of print on your other... Uh, oh, jeez. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny. Uh, we may as well talk about this right now. No, go ahead. Um, uh, saga albums have become like baseball cards you know you get a, a warren spawn rookie card well that's the that's the fullerton dam breaks album and it's rare as hell but it's awful <laughs> the covers at least are awful the music is not doesn't sound very good but it's okay right but they're going for stupid money because they're so rare you know, uh, so it's it's really like that whole collector's baseball cards. And it was really interesting because I, I posted it on my Facebook page uh, as I'm getting ready to release my next album. What format do you want this in? And I just posted that on Facebook. 95% said they wanted CDs. 5% basically said they wanted vinyl. And there was a handful that said download. So that's, they, they want to hold it in their hands. It's that, that same mentality that made vinyl so popular. You know, the fact that you got the 12 inch cover and you could turn it over while you're listening, and put the album on the turntable and drop the needle and read the liner notes and it's big. You know, people love that. That's what we don't have with CDs. I can never read the damn labels, you know? And uh, this is just a rough, but uh, you probably can't see that very well. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can see that. It's, it's, it looks all right, yeah. This is just a rough as we're working on the, uh, here we go. No, that, that image on the far, uh, the bottom right side uh, from my angle that's, looks wonderful, but very tasteful. Image. That's the cover. It's not that uh, font, but... Uh, yeah, I've been actually in the last four months, I've been trying to get my album cover done and uh, actually had my graphics guy had some serious health issues and I had to find somebody else to actually finish it. So that that is the image uh, that's that's going to be on the cover. It's actually uh, I'm doing a digi pack, so it's a six panel fold. And I'm just in the throes and, and uh, getting that done. So I, I'd say I'm about a week away from sending that off to the manufacturers and getting my CDs made. Fantastic news. And, and just to close out on your tenure in Saga, you did come back for about, what, another 10 years, 10, 12 years uh, from the early 90s up to around, what, uh, Marathon in 03. What was your take on that second side to your career in saga what, what was it a little different for you uh as a player just your your state of mind during that second era for you in the band yeah it was good at first uh, i was i think you can notice as we get further in uh i was starting to lose interest in the whole project um we got into this thing whereby uh, there was 
I had booked a trip to Barbados uh, with my wife and Jimmy called me up and said he wanted me to come to LA and record that week. And I said, no. So they, uh, I said, you, you move the dates. You know, I, I've got my holiday booked. I've already paid for it. I'm going to Barbados. And uh, they said, nope, that's it. If you can't make it, we'll hire somebody else. I said, okay, go ahead. And they got Glenn Sobel, I think. Yeah, that was Pleasure in the Pain, I believe, uh, 97. Yeah. Yeah. So at that point, things were really starting to, we were starting to go different directions around that time. Um, you did a great, I'm, I have to just commend you on this, because it's one of my favorite pieces when it comes to when I, uh, drum related records that I listen to for, for the drums. I mean, aside from everything else, but I really hone in on the drums. Your drum work on the Security of Illusion in 93, which is your first record back in the band since Behavior in 85, to me is astounding. It, just your work on a song like Without You with the big oh, tribal no. drums opening up the track and what nine closing out the track fading out love that fantastic yeah that the that act that whole song was uh triggered by my drum solo actually because i i was still using the moog drum and uh oh i know we did a we did a second version of briefcase you know the the original a briefcase one. yeah yeah so what I would do is I would start it with the uh, with the Moog drum and it went don't don't butter the dump don't don't butter the dump don't butter the dump don't butter the dump and then Mike and I we worked out this whole new version of that right so that actually became without you and uh, it was really cool that that was fun and it, it it's uh, we had a, a bunch of drummers come in and and all play that rhythm right. I think it was about 20 guys we had. So that's why the, you've got that really nice lumpy groove. And then the kit comes in over top of that. And uh, yeah, so that that's where that song came from. Without you, I'm trying to remember what else was on the album. There's so many albums and the later albums uh, are not as clearly etched as uh, the early ones. Well, uh, another one off that record, Security of Illusion, that stands out for me is, um, besides Without You, is Once Is Never Enough. I, I love what you, what you play on that as well. Okay. I, and to be honest with you, right off the hop, I can't think of what I actually did on that one. Mind Over Matter, which to me is very straightforward rock type track, but I love your work on that. Yeah, I, I was... Uh... At that point, I was starting to get into what Jimmy used to call these mix master fills. You know, it's a lot of uh, drag stuff, right? Yeah. Where you're actually dragging stuff. So you get all this, it makes it kind of spongy. And uh, yeah, so I, used, I was doing all these mix master fills because I just, that's where I happened to be going at that time. And uh, yeah, it, it definitely gave it a different feel. You know, yeah. So fantastic. yeah, I, I, I mean the, uh, I can't at this point envision once is never enough. I can't, uh, I can't think of what I played on. I would if I heard it. It's astounding to say the least. Uh, but um, and and then now moving to the present, you you've got a you've already talked about it a bit, but you've got a new solo record coming out, which I'm very excited to hear because it, it'll be your first in, in several years, right? And- um, That's my first in 10 years. Yeah. Actually, what, a little bit more, but. what motivated you? What made you believe that today, right now was the right time to do this really, as far as uh, making a new <laughs> solo record? It's actually a case of I finally finished it. Uh, what I did, uh, I was playing actually in an eight piece R&B band locally after I left Saga uh, called Powerhouse, just a local eight piece with four piece horn section. Well, uh, and I would go out and gig with them while I was working at home on my own stuff. With my own stuff, I wanted to explore. I always, I always need my challenge, right? I always need something that's moving me forward. It's like forward thinking and it's not, I don't want to just regurgitate what I did back then. 
So I'm looking for new ways to uh, express myself with new grooves. So I got this idea that I was going to listen to, and I did anyway, but I wanted to incorporate more what I call world music. So I was listening to African stuff and I was listening to some jazz. I was listening to a lot of Latino stuff. And uh, then, then basically I had to figure out how they play that stuff because there's a mindset to that stuff, which is totally different from R&B. The kick drum isn't on the one, you know, it's somewhere out behind it. So, and the same with reggae. I mean, reggae, I love anyway. I, I love the island grooves. And uh, to play the Latin stuff, it, it requires a whole different way of approach and a different way of thinking when applying it to a drum kit, because really it's built on four or five percussionists all playing different rhythms together, right? So, I mean, lots of people have done it before. It's not like it's an original idea, but to incorporate those rhythms into drum a drum kit is uh, it requires a lot of thought and exercise to do it, right? It's a uh, physical challenge, if you like, to have the independence to be able to play those kind of things. So as I was working on those rhythms, first of all, I had to come uh, figure out how to play the Latino versions. Then I had to make it my own. So what I did is uh, I took a, a, a Latino rhythm and I put did it in seven, eight. So, and, and all the time with these, it still has to maintain that funkiness that body groove even you're, you're playing a seven eight or 15 eight it's still got to have that funky feel to it which requires a lot of thought and trial and error and that's what took the time you know so i mean there's there's time signatures all over this album uh actually you probably can't i have the album up at the moment the first track is called the gathering now the let's let's back up for a second economy of motion is the title of this album uh which came from a conversation with kelly my guitar player uh it's how you get speed and fluidity with minimal effort that's what it's all about so i rethought my drum kit uh I made stuff lower because I was working on my uh, my Roland kit and I was flying around the kit going, yeah, this is easy, I, you know. Then I set up my acoustic kit and I went, oh my God. Uh, with the Roland kit, obviously the, the, the shells are only this thick so you can get, you can drop everything down nice and low. So you're flying around the kit like this as opposed to like this, right? And the power in drumming is down here. It's not up here. So I had to rethink my whole drum kit, acoustic kit, to get everything lower down so that I could play like I played on the Roland kit. So I've uh, actually, let me show you something. Yeah, go right in. In the meantime, I switched from DW to Pearl. So I, I got a new Pearl kit and uh, I came up with this idea that the snare drum that I used on Worlds Apart, Heads or Tails, right from the Worlds Apart on was a, a Ludwig, uh, <clears throat> it's called a slotted Coliseum. The, the shell is actually two pieces with a hole all the way around the middle which I'll show you next time. But I got this idea when I switched to Pearl. Now, the cool thing about the Pearl stuff is there's three different woods used in my kit, in my 
It's called a reference kit. They use birch for the uh, small toms, then they maple for the mids, and then they add mahogany for the, the kick drum and floor toms. Mahogany is a warmer wood, maple's a mid tone, and, and birch is bright. Well, I started to record with that kit and I went, I need more attack. So uh, because that snare drum was split in the middle, I love that thing. It, it's like a cannon. It's so freaking loud. It's the loudest snare drum I've ever seen. It, this thing is, I still use it. So I decided to do a whole kit, split shell. Wow. So this is actually, as you can see, it's cut in half and then joined back together. And it has obviously this air vent all the way around. And this sounds freaking awesome. So that's your, you, you, that's, that's all you, you put that together. I did. I actually, I, I didn't so. want to, I didn't want to tell Pearl I was doing it. I said, you know, yeah, I just, I'm new to the Pearl family. I got my, uh, high-end reference kit. So I didn't want to tell them I was going to cover the, their drums in half. <laughs> you know, so I what I did is I bought an, uh, this is a Pearl Vision kit. This is all birch. And I bought a, just a five-piece kit from a buddy of mine. And then I took it to my drum guy and I said, cut them all in half. I want shallower shells because I want to get them over my bass drum. So uh, on the on the rack, so I was ori originally thinking of going to a twenty inch bass drum. I used a twenty two, and I thought, no, I love the sound of a twenty two, so I can't change that. I've got to make the toms shorter. So that's what we did. We actually this is normally a little bit deeper than this, so we shortened the actual uh, shell and we cut it in half, and then we figured out how to rejoin this together with we, we did with these uh, stainless steel strips. I was originally thinking we would do like a plexiglass that so you wouldn't see it. So it looked like it's actually floating, right? But anyway, I did a whole kit like that, which is uh, what you're gonna see on the, the album cover, uh, which is also, I don't know if you can see that. Oh yeah, I can see that. That's my studio kit, which is just out there. And I have a whole set like that. They're all cut in half. The bigger drums, what I did is I ported them because I didn't want to uh, sacrifice the integrity of a big shell. So this is a whole new design kit. And as far as I know, no one has ever done this. And uh, I was very hesitant to mention to Pearl that I was cutting their drums in half. But I love what's happened is, is that they give me they give me the character I'm looking for, which is more aggressive, uh, more bite, more volume, and less less decay. But it's not like a single head because the single head, the time, the 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 decay just goes, whoop, the air goes out because there's no response from the bottom head. And this is somewhere in between, and I love it, and it's all birch. So for years I used I only used maple. Everything I the Ludwig's I played were maple, the DWs I played were maple. So going to Pearl, this kind of opened my eyes to some new things, and I really love this the sound of the the aggressiveness of the birch. You know, the the kick drum sounds awesome. So that's what you're playing throughout the entirety of this new album, correct? Yeah. Wonderful. I can't wait to hear. I love the fact that you're still pushing the envelope. You're still trying to improve on what you already brought to the table as a uh, musician. I, yeah, I can't, I can't think of any other way to do it. You know, I mean, uh, from a playing standpoint, over the summer, I wrote myself a drum course. I was, because I sit out on my front porch and I have my morning coffee. And I thought, okay, what I want to do is I want to, uh, increase the dexterity of my snare hand. So what I did is I wrote uh, a whole, I just tapped them out. I went, okay, this is how I do it. Because I'm so totally self-taught. 
like uh, no one ever told told me anything except what not to do. Um, so, which and being left-handed, I think these are all things that kind of uh, affect my originality, if you like, because I I've always found I'm I am my own best teacher. So what I did is I put together this drum course and then I gave it to myself. And uh, I'm working on that right now and, and it's building blocks. So you, you never stop working on it. You're always progressing, right? So uh, that in conjunction with my drum kit is, uh, yeah, I'm still pushing the envelope and the grooves. You know, uh, there's actually, uh, there's one piece that changes uh, time signatures about eight or nine times. And there's actually a, set, a section where it, it's seven over five. So the guitar is playing in seven and I'm playing in five eight, right? And it works. <clears throat> but like I say, the, the trick is to get all this stuff to feel musical. You know, everybody can play seven, eight, nine, eight, and sixteen, eight. You know, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, and just uh, you know, put a, put together a bunch of syncopated bits. But to actually play it and have it groove is is a whole other issue, and that takes time. So that's why it's taken me ten years to do this album, and. Uh, what I would do is I would just start working on grooves and, and I would play them till I was totally comfortable with them. Then I would actually hear the music that went with them. So that was the process and it was not a, a fast process. You're talking about all these different influences on your record uh, in your playing and in the songs. You mentioned the island grooves that are uh, featured. Um, just out of curiosity, when I know Saga has a huge fan base in Puerto Rico, did uh, any of that seep into your mind while uh, you were over there during those uh, years and whatnot? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I can remember when we played in Venezuela, I, uh, somebody from the record company, I said, get me some tapes of the local stuff. And uh, who did I listen to? Uh, there was several players that I, I realized, Willie Colon was one of them. Uh, these guys were the, the big Latino guys. Nobody ever heard of them over here. And, and I got these tapes and I listened to them and I just kind of absorbed them. But you know, what really got me into the Latino stuff to begin with was the first album we did without a click track. We just set up and recorded, hit record and away we went. Uh, second album, when Greg Chad came into band, I think I told you, he blamed everyone else for his own inadequacies. And he, he actually turned to me, he says, your timing suspect. And I said, what? And it, obviously if you listen to the first album, that's not done to a click, that's all just live. The timing's pretty damn good. So I said, you bastard. I'm gonna play this next album to a click track, just to show you that my timing is not suspect. Uh, so I got a little, uh, it was a little chord percussion unit. It was about, it was about this size, right? It wasn't very big, a little bit bigger. And all it had was cheesy uh, Latino, so congas and bongos and tambourine and cowbell and clave. And I put together this click track, which the other guys refuse to listen to because it's crazy. So uh, the problem with when I first tried to use a click was that the quarter notes doesn't work because you got talk, 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 talk. As soon as you play a straight kick and snare, it's all over your click track. The only time you hear the click is when you're off of it. So what I did is I got this tambourine and I put it on the upbeat. So dunk, 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 dunk. and then I would add, uh, I would have a cowbell and clavies. So dunk, tick, 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 bump. So I'd actually put the quarter notes in there, but then I would put like congas, and the tambourine on the ends. 
so I was already getting into the uh, the Latino approach of using percussion back in the second album. But that that was heads or tails, or sorry, uh, images at twilight, right? Images at twilight. That's what yeah. I meant. To say. So and, and all the albums that I from that point on were all done to that same click. Wow, which adds an uh, another. It adds another layer of stuff because I'm being I'm being influenced by what I'm hearing, but you're not hearing it, but you're feeling it, and and that would uh, it definitely affects how you phrase your fills, you know how how things feel. There's this underlying groove that is almost subliminal, right? And that that's really uh, I'm always playing to that. The other boys didn't couldn't listen to it. It's too confusing for them. Is it too much information? Because it's all the stuff around the quarter notes that is key, right? It, the quarter notes are just there to, to show where the bar starts, but it's all the syncopated stuff, which is basically the essence of Latin music, right? Latin music, obviously based on the clave, uh, <clears throat> and then you break your rhythms up accordingly off the clave right mm -hmm. so yeah that was a it was a whole learning process and uh, the hardest thing was not playing to kick on the one right kick doesn't go on the one in latin music it's that that's right it, it's uh something else plays the one it's usually the snare or, or something but the kick drum is always playing syncopated behind it you know, they get and it's a really cool syncopation, but most uh, most rock guys don't play like that. They don't think like that either. And it was cool. Uh, did you ever hear the uh, reggae version of Humble Stance? Yeah, once. It's been a while. But yeah, the, I, I always, to me, it really did break out what to me was already there. Because to me, that song already had a tinge of a reggae sort of influence to it. So the fact that it yeah. went there almost seemed organic, like an organic just thing, right? Yeah, that was yeah. just an idea I had. And, I thought, and it was really cool to see the confusion on people's faces Yeah, when we started that. But uh, uh, one of the, the things that was really funny is Jim Gilmore being the white guy that he has. He, I mean, he obviously doesn't have the same influence like i mean i i love the caribbean i love the islands in fact i'm off to costa rica again uh, next month i love the island stuff but uh, reggae obviously the kick drum falls on the two and four not on the one and three and when i would start that rhythm for that button that couple button that button, button but uh, so uh he always felt he couldn't hear the the kick drum was being two and four he heard it as one. So he would always come in backwards. <laughs> so I'd have to flip the groove around. So that anyway. but that, that's just a case of, of uh, the influences that you have. We, we don't always have the same influences. Right, so that was right. a, a case where, uh, you know, that was obviously my island uh, groove coming through. Steve, I love everything I'm hearing about this new record. I have to hear it as soon as possible. Is there a release date yet for it? Well, I like I said, I, uh, uh, Beanie just sent me what is presumably the final artwork this morning. And uh, he's just, he took it to the printers today. We'll get it back uh, probably tomorrow. If it's good to go, then basically I'm off to the CD uh, manufacturing plant. The master's done. It's over there, ready to go. The CD master. So I've just been held up with the graphics. So I would venture to say that uh, it's probably on the outside. It's going to be a month from now. What I do have is uh, I have the album up on um, on Dropbox. So I can send you a link to that. Just uh, by all means, please let me know when it's ready to go, because I would like to, as well as uh, I would love to hear it on Dropbox, but I would also like to 
purchase a copy for your hard earned work because I do believe in in that and in supporting all the artists that I admire and you're one of them so uh definitely cool. want to make sure you're compensated for the 10 years the decade that you put into this uh record which I, is a labor I, of love right so yes I yeah it's all about making the music this is the first time I've done an al an album completely to please myself and I'm actually glad that I did you know because it enabled it empowered me to do things that I wouldn't normally do. You know, if I was trying to have commercial success, I, I, there's a lot of things I wouldn't have done the same. And uh, a lot of these are, they're almost like musical jigsaw puzzles because it, there's kind of like the gentle giant stuff, you know, where you get these really unusual rhythms and they fit together. There's a lot of that going on on this album. It's good news. You know, I can't wait to hear it. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm certainly pleased. It, it's it's uh, <clears throat> time that I got this stuff finished. <coughs> it's taken a while, but uh, it's all about the journey. So, you know, finally, I'm just going to put this out because I finally finished it. You know, but it took me ten years to do this one. So it sounds to me like it was an all-encompassing, this, this is like something that is an all-encompassing demonstration of who you are as a master musician. And uh, I would say so, because I actually played, uh, I played most of the keyboards on this. I played uh, acoustic guitar on one track, which is, uh, I did all the guitars and there's lots of them. Uh, on the opening track is actually uh, orchestral, version of the theme which i did and we did 100 tracks of vocals on it it's for the choir which was myself al who sang on my last album and my wife nicole she sings in a, a, a female barbershop group so she's a singer the three of us did 100 tracks of vocals on this so and that, that's only in one little section right but wow. it's, it's really cool uh, I basically did whatever I felt was, uh, would be cool. And, uh, there's the orchestral version opens the album. There is an, an acoustic version of the same thing, which I did all the guitars on acoustic guitars, which is the same theme, but you would never, you won't realize it unless I tell you, right. You might, after a ton of listenings, you might pick up on it. But it's exactly the same theme, which is uh, presented in the uh, orchestral version. I actually wrote the acoustic version first. And then I went, OK, I want to do an orchestral because this this got to be big. You know, this is uh, it's go big or stay home and stay home. <laughs> right. uh, so, yeah, I, I'm pretty pleased with what it is. And uh, I live with the mixes long enough to to realize that that it's done thanks again for, for honestly for for your time it really uh means a lot not a problem yeah so neil peart passed away um it seems like not too long ago and he was he's the old he to me he was one of the ultimate drummers and i know saga and rush did uh you know collide at certain points uh you know both canadian bands of course so uh, do you have a Neil Peart story uh, by any chance? Not really. I mean, we grew up five miles apart, but we didn't know each other because uh, he was from Beamsville, which is basically like five miles from Grimsby. So he grew up in that same area as I did. Uh, from there, I mean, I mean, we were two completely different people. You know, Neil liked to read books, and uh, he had a, a very sensitive intellect. He was not a not much of a people person. He he was he liked his privacy. He played in a trio, so he had obviously a lot more room than I did. Um, Stylistically, I, I think we're, although Saga and Rush, I mean, we toured together and we got along great and I loved the boys. You know, I, I actually uh, 
used to hang out with Getty in, in Toronto when, when we lived close to each other. But it, it kind of stops there in that, that we're so different from each other, uh, both as people and playing styles. It's really hard to, to put Rush and Saga in the same genre. Why do you know people? I mean? Why do you think people do that? Because it seems like whenever people want to compare Saga to another Prague-related band, Prague-adjacent band, they always bring it to Rush. But to me, Saga has kind of always been on their own turf, musically speaking. Well, because we came up together, basically, uh, Rush, uh, Bax Webster, and Saga were kind of like the three big Toronto bands that that all came up together and graduated to the concert circuit and international success. Uh, completely different format. I mean, uh, I used to find it really hard to watch Neil play because I could see that he was hurting himself. Uh, if you look at uh, closely at some of those videos, he would hit the snare so hard and would not pull off of it. And you can see the shock wave go up his arm into his neck. And for me, it's painful. I mean, I know how much damage he did to himself by just playing too hard and not, not playing. You, you can't say it correctly, but the, the, the mechanics of playing it, there's, there's things you can do and things you can't do. There's things you can do for a while, and if you don't change them, they're going to get you. And he was one of those guys. He was, I mean, he was, when he finished uh, his career, if you like, with Rush, he was a mess. His body was just torn to pieces. And it, it, it's always bugged me that he did that because, I mean, I, you know, a lot of people love what he did as a player. And, uh, you know, it's just a shame. It's really a shame. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of, you know, that, I mean, I get compared to Neil, but the fact that we both played drums is probably the only real comparison there is because our, our way of thinking and our approach is like worlds apart, pardon the pun, right? Yeah. But he was a wonderful human being. And, uh, you know, I think he found it really hard to deal with the uh, notoriety. You know, I'm, uh, like I say, coming from a, more of an R&B background, I'm more of a hangout, let's have a beer kind of guy than, than Neil was. You know, I. It's to me, drumming is not about intellect. It's it's got more to do with the body, and the body groove. And there's just something about movement that that is is inherent in what I do, and it's it's what I love. So I'm more of a rhythm section kind of guy, you know. And that really that's inherent in the the R and B school of thought. The rhythm section plays together and they play together you know it you know what i'm saying oh yeah so in in that respect what uh, we're so different completely different people well you thanks know. for i mean i had to ask that question only because there's a photo that gets passed along the saga forums from time to time uh it's a backstage photo it might have been 79 80 of you and neil backstage at a show yeah um, and and I had so for that's that my picture. Oh, that's yeah, that's my okay. picture. Yeah, that's uh, that's Getty and Neil and myself and Gary McCracken. Gary was the drummer with uh, Max Webster. And uh, he, when I first started doing the Simmons clinics, Gary used to come out and do them with me. Great player, really great player. That was backstage of uh, Saga opening for UK, John Wedden. Johnny Wetton. Yeah, fantastic. And yeah, jo and Johnny later opened for us, and I used to hang hang out with him every day for sound check because he basically he just came out solo, and uh, 
played his acoustic guitar. So we would do like reggae versions of Stairway to Heaven, just fun stuff. <clears throat> and uh, I went to see him in Montreal just uh, before he passed. He was doing a UK gig out in Montreal. So we all went for, to Montreal from here to go and see him, my, my local people. Yeah. He was an undeniably uh, fantastic singer, had a unique tone to his, uh, to his voice. Yeah. Yeah, really great, great stuff. I really like Johnny Wet. Yeah, Did and, you ever see, see the, because he, when he opened for us, he would come out during our show and we would do Only Time Will Tell. Yeah, it was during the, uh, what ended up becoming the uh, Detours, like live album, really. And uh, during that tour, I believe it was like 97, 98, touring in support of Pleasure and the Pain. Uh, yeah, there is footage of that on YouTube for those that uh, are unaware. But yeah, fantastic stuff. Yeah, yeah, it, it was cool. That, uh, because Carl yeah, Palmer did a lot of the Asia stuff. Yeah, and uh, he's got lots of chops and not too much groove going on. You're the groove master. That's really what it comes down to. I think you just have you. That's an element that I immediately saw it out when I heard Saga was the groove. I mean, I first heard Don't Be Late and then uh, going into Worlds Apart with a song like Amnesia. And then of course, Humble Stance to me, um, or something like Out of the Shadows on Behavior. It, to me, groove to me is what gave you that extra edge. It gave that to it gave Saga that extra edge that really completed that the, 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 the dynamics really in the, in the sound. Yeah, yeah, so. it's all about the groove. That's right. And uh, never, go ahead. Sorry. Never underestimate the power of the groove. <laughs> I, I love rhythm to me, as is in music. When I hear whether it be pop music, rock music, R&B, soul, whatever it is, jazz, smooth jazz. Um, to me, groove is what kind of brings helps bring me into the pictures. So uh, I always loved your work as a masterful drummer. And um, I would like to say in closing, I would like to ask you one final question that question being what is your greatest accomplishment as a musician is there something that you feel really um is the best thing that you've ever done to say the least well i think my greatest accomplishment is to have spent my whole life playing drums that's uh that's really cool because when you start out as a kid uh I, I never in my wildest dreams, pardon the pun, uh, thought that I would spend my whole life playing drums in a band. That, that's pretty incredible, you know, to be able to do that. You know, it's, uh, that's probably my biggest highlight. I spent my whole life doing something I love and I, it doesn't get any better than that. So that would, that would have to be my biggest highlight. You know, from a show standpoint, I would probably be uh, Rock and Ring. That was 85, right? Yeah. Yeah. There was, yeah, there's the 85 show. That was a huge festival. That was really cool. And uh, it was interesting because uh, Krista Berg was on the other day, headlining the other day. Because it's a two-day show and Krista Berg went to number one and Saga went to number two I don't think the boys were too pleased about that <laughs> but it is what it is so it, I, I really love doing the Krista Berg album I, again it, it was kind of an epiphany for me and in, in that uh, it changed my way of thinking you know and to this day, I, I still, the things that I was changing thoughts about then still apply, you know? And yet so, you're still pushing the boundaries because you've mentioned this new record, which be out very soon in which you've rethought a lot of things. You've uh, created a new drum kit that to me uh, really does take things to an even deeper, higher kinetic level when it comes to your drum ability. Yeah, it's, it's you got to push the envelope. I mean, that's just my my nature, you know. Uh, and I, I play every day. I get I usually get a, at least a couple of hours in. 
And every day I'm pushing the envelope to be better, you know, which is, uh, it's, it would be really easy to sit back. I, I'm actually, uh, today is the 15th, four days is my 71st birthday. And I'm still pushing the envelope at 71. It would be really easy to sit back and say, I'm retired. But I can't do that. So I'm going to go in my room and work up a sweat and try and be better. <laughs> Pretty odd, but it works for me. As long as it works for you, I, I commend that. I, I, I think like uh, I have a restless mind, so I could never stop trying for something or, or to achieve a certain goal. And uh, I think it's really commendable, I think, for anybody who hears this, that um, you as a world-class musician still continue to push the envelope with yourself. Got to do it. Forward thinking is really, that's a key. It's really a key. Steve, you've been an absolute, I mean, all the guys in Saga really, but you've been a, a class act uh, chatting with me today. I always like to treat these interviews more like discussions and, and you really did provide that it, uh, nonetheless. And I really do uh, appreciate the time that you took to uh, talk to me on this little grassroots thing, brand called Sonic Dorms. I've been building up for about two and a half years now on my own, just trying to build something of a solid music community of people who actually appreciate and want to be educated on music and in such a way, uh, intellectualizing it a bit, also having a good time while doing that. So you d definitely sum that message up uh, with your words here today. It's uh, been very fun, but also very educational. And that to me is something that I strive to do every time I have a musician on this show. Fantastic. My so, pleasure. Uh, I'm looking forward to the album. I can't say that enough. I've said it countless times already to you. I'm, I'm sure you're going to get sick and tired of hearing that at this point. So <laughs> no, you actually, you never get sick and tired of hearing it. If All right. People love what you do. You want to hear it. That's sure. why you do it. <laughs> there you go. Right. Hey, uh, I, I will definitely be sending out the birthday message too, but um, just want to say uh, happy birthday when it's four days from now, but uh, I hope you have a really good one this year. Thank you. All right, Steve, uh, you're always welcome back, by the way. I hope we can talk again once the record's actually out and I've probably dissected it uh, 10, 12, 20 times. It'd be great to maybe go into some of the tracks on the record if you don't mind doing that. With Absolutely. Me. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. All right, Steve, uh, I hope you have a pleasant day and uh, all the best. Thanks for joining me here on Sonic Dorms, the great Steve Nagus. Thank you.